Okay, guys, so I basically had to update the poly mega webcam. It's like one of these giant, like, commercial industrial webcams. Now, if you can see me, awesome. Let me know in the chat section. Also, let me know if I sound okay on this microphone. Now, with that said, a lot of people have been asking me because they are very worried about what's going on with the federal government. And a lot of the questions tend to focus on who can turn on and off my retirement and disability benefits at the Social Security Administration. Another question I get that we're going to be answering is who can increase and decrease my retirement and Social Security disability benefits at the SSA? Um, those two groups are kind of at the lower level. And then another question we're going to be answering with this video is essentially who can create rule changes and new things that you would need to essentially complete administratively to keep your social security benefits. So we're going to be going through all of these different features, who can turn off the benefits, who can turn it on, who can change the amount, and then basically who can really do rule changes and stuff like that. Now, when it comes to SSI, supplemental security income, most of those benefit changes, most of those benefit details are done at the local field office. When it comes to SSDI benefits, some of the changes for SSDI benefits are done uh, as essentially the local field office, but also at specific specialty disability SSDI groups that will go ahead and handle things throughout the country, including uh, attorney fee payment and stuff like that. So SSDI actually reaches out to some different people all over the country. So they're kind of tougher to track down. Same thing with retirement benefits. A lot of choices and decisions are handled at the local field office. Some you have to get the extension number because that person might be in a completely different state away from where you're at. William Randall, thank you. Thank you for the $5 donation. I super appreciate it. I really, really appreciate the donations, guys. Um, there's something going on right now, or basically Cheyenne, she helped me build in the very beginning with this channel to go ahead and take it to the next level. Um, her son right now basically is uh, essentially competing out there uh, in the different arena to go ahead and get a scholarship for school. Uh, he's a really top-notch player. Um, he's able to, I think that's him. Yeah, that's him right there. Um, he's able to do really incredible stuff. Um, if you get a chance to do a donation, wow, it really zoomed in there. Let me pop back. There we go. There we go. Cool. I put at the very top of the chat section essentially how you can donate to uh, basically her kid being able to drive around and go to these different basketball games. Just so you know, real quick sidestep, he's going and competing in these specialty games, which allow him to be seen by, I guess they're like uh, coaches or spotters or whatever, so that he can potentially get a scholarship. And uh, the whole point of it is she's got to drive him around. She's literally taking him uh, to Atlanta, Georgia, Texas, Las Vegas. All these places and the food, you know, the hotels, all that stuff adds up. Cool thing, too, which I asked about is that she's going to be bringing her little piggies along for the drive. So that's pretty cool right there. Anyways, let's get back to the video. Most of the functions of increasing or decreasing your benefits on a small scale are done at the local field office or somewhere through a special division. How do you get a hold of these people? The number one way that you can get a hold of them is uh, basically by calling up the local field office and asking for the extension of the person that's handling the issue that you're having. Now, with that said, um, if you're not able to get a hold of the local field office, you should reach out to the regional field office. The regional field office probably is not in your state. So like for me in Florida, the regional field office is in Georgia. So what you need to know is when you reach out to the regional office, they can usually get a hold of people in ways that you cannot. So with that said, obviously there's a big problem at the SSA right now. They're at a 25 year low with the amount of employees that they have working there because they just can't get people and they can't keep people. So expect uh, basically the government to find some additional funding so that they can go forward and hire more people because a lot of the money that Biden gave them to go ahead and increase their funding was sucked up into essentially the inflation game that we're going through right now. Now, with that said, the next question of, well, who can change the laws? Who can change or modify, you know, basically the things that make it harder for me to retain my benefits or maybe increase benefits or include some sort of stimulus to those who are on social security benefits? Well, in that instance, we go to the very bottom of essentially our totem pole when it comes to like the more executive figures. I'm gonna walk you through who's on this totem pole of executive figures. You end up at the president at the very top, but we're gonna start down here. Um, the Office of Civil Rights and Equal Opportunity, right, right here. And these are the actual divisions inside the SSA in case you need to get a hold of one of them. Then we get to the Office of Analytics, Review and Oversight. 
Then we get to the Office of the Deputy Commissioner for Retirement and Disability Policy. Then we get to the Office of Deputy Commissioner, Office of Hearing Operations, right? That's your ALJs, AAJs, stuff like that. The Office of Communications, the Office of the Actuary, that's Steve Goss, right? The Office of Deputy Commissioner, Legislation and Congressional Affairs, right? Then we get all the way up to the Office of SSA General Counsel. That's an S9. Now we're talking about like the executive, executive offices of the SSA. Then we get to the office of the SSA Inspector General. So sorry, we were at first the SSA General Counsel, S9. And then S8 is the office of the SSA Inspector General. Then we go to S7, which is the office of the Deputy Commissioner on Human Resources. So now we're getting into the Deputy Commissioners, right? The people directly below the Commissioner of the Social Security Administration. Now we go to uh, essentially S4. It has a little jump there. The Office of Deputy Commissioner of Systems. Then we go to S2, the Office of Deputy Commissioners of Operations. Then we go to S1, the Office of Deputy Commissioner, Budget, Finance, and Management. And then we get to SA. SA is, that's it. It doesn't go any higher than that. That is the Office of the Commissioner of the Social Security Administration. That's Commissioner Kijikazi. These are the category groups that basically handle the big operations and changes. They put out the ideas of maybe changing a rule or law for your Social Security benefits. What you need to know is this. These groups all right here, I mean, you could break it down. Like the, the, the SA, the Office of the, of the Commissioner of the SSA would be the CEO. Then you get the Office of the Deputy Budget Finance and Management. That would be kind of like your president. Then you get to the Office of Deputy Commissioner of Operations. That would be your COO, right? That would be your you know, uh, chief of, you know, operations. Then you get to your, the office of deputy commissioner of systems. That would be kind of like your system analysts. Those that have like specific systems that operate within the general program. Uh, that would be kind of like your next step down. Then you get to the office of deputy commissioner for human resources, et cetera, right? The CHR, et cetera. So chief of human re uh, relations. So, or resources rather. These are your super executives, for the most part, you will never be able to get a hold of them. However, and I will say this, and it's important, these individuals show up usually at attorney-related events. So if you ever wanted to meet with one of them or express a problem to one of them um, and have a face-to-face -face or at least be able to answer, you know, ask them a question while you're sitting in kind of a grouping of people while they're on the stage... Uh, there are attorney events such as like NOSCAR and stuff like that, where these individuals will sometimes show up and you can usually call ahead of time and ask, Hey, are these people likely to show up? Now, with that said, if it's the commissioner of the SSA and they say, Hey, this person's going to be there, she might not show up. She might not actually show up when she's on the schedule to show up because obviously the commissioner of the SSA reports directly to the president of the United States. Now, in order for big rule changes to happen, you know, system changes, you know, major system changes, not just social security rulings and stuff like that, where like, you know, there might be a battle between two, you know, circuit courts, right, as to who should do what. And this circuit court says you should handle this law this way. And this circuit court says you should handle it this way. And boom, they go into this battle, right, as to what should happen. That's when a social security ruling will come out. And that's when the SSA basically through the commissioner puts her foot in the arena and says, this is how we're doing it going forward. But those are little changes, right? Compared to the mega changes that you could essentially have with Congress and the president signing things into law. Many of you guys want major appropriation of funds to be used for the Social Security Administration to make it so that retirement, Medicare, et cetera, are in a long-term sense going to be more capable of lasting through the years. All the people on this list from the commissioner down do not have the capability of doing that because when you get into multi-agency interactions, you know, where the funds have to come from the treasury and the treasury has to speak with the IRS and the IRS has to clear it with the SSA. The only people who really do that are essentially the SSA commissioner working out deals. And if it's about big money, right, not just like, you know, paying them to keep doing what they're supposed to already be doing, but big money, mega funding, stuff like that, you're always going to need the Congress and president combination to make that work. Now, with that said, 
Um, the SSA is going through a crisis right now. And people have been asking me, well, look, if they can't afford new employees and more employees, like how are they going to afford the benefits? So the way it works is that the president through finance, you know, budget commission will go ahead and make choices about how much they want to fund the SSA. President Biden actually wanted significantly more of an increase for the SSA, but ultimately it was decided that they weren't going to do that. They're going to do a smaller amount, a lesser amount. As the result of that, the SSA is having a hard time keeping and having employees. Now, here's what's going on behind the scenes that you're not really going to know about, that they're not going to talk about. President Biden gave Commissioner Kijikazi a list of things that he wanted her to work on. There's the you know equity and race-related stuff. But the main thing that is the focal point here or the problem is that he wanted her to reestablish positive relations with the unions. And the unions, unfortunately, know this. And because they know this, they are basically beating her up because they know that the president sent her to do a job. And unless she makes them happy, right, by doing benefit increases, doing monetary increases for those who work with the SSA, decreasing their workload, et cetera, unless she makes them happy, then she has, you know, if she can't make them happy, then she's failed the president. So the commissioner of the SSA is in a tight spot and President Biden put her there. He put her there in two ways, A, not enough funding and B, basically he told those unions that are in charge of those SSA local field office reps, regional office reps, hearing office reps, et cetera, and the judges. He told her that one of her main things was to reestablish and uh, have good relations with the unions. Now, as you know, when you don't have enough money to increase the payments or the benefits due to government employees, it is pretty much impossible to go ahead and make the unions happy because the unions are there with their people to have a collective bargaining power to make the SSA give their employees more money each year. But when Commissioner Kijikazi doesn't have extra money because the extra money she got is being eaten up in the massive inflation that we have, she's stuck. That's why last Thursday, those heads went to the news stations and did a whole big article on it. Now, what can we expect from her, which is what this is really coming down to? How will this affect your benefits? Who's in control of, you know, moving and redirecting your benefits, but how will this ultimately affect your benefits with what she has to do with get, keeping the SSA on track? So the SSA needs some basics here. They need more employees. They need fewer people applying, and they basically need more time to process the claims they already have. So the first problem is they're not able to keep a lot of their employees because the benefits aren't good. They're not happy. And, and the, the quotas are at max for every employee. So a lot of people throughout their work life, before they became retired or disabled, worked at a job where they didn't have a quota. But there's another smaller group of people who did have a quota. They had to spend this much time and complete this many tasks within that amount of time, right? That was your quota. And you had to do so many of those within a week. Well, similar to that in SSA land, you have a person who essentially will go ahead and have to process and review 50 claims or 100 claims. And they're all maxed out. And so the problem is that none of these people are having a, a high and then a low and then a high. Everybody's all maxed out all the time. So everybody's quota is constantly full and maxed out, which makes employees really pissy because they can never get all the work done. The system was more so designed that if it's maxed out, that those employees of the SSA will kind of catch up when things drop back down. But instead, it's just max all the time. So as a result of that, when you call places like DDS, DDS essentially will you know, you know do things that annoy people. They won't call people back. They won't call people with status updates. They won't do the usual calls asking for permission for things. So what Commissioner Kijikazi did is she just got a huge group of federal employees together at the local field offices and had them start doing essentially, and not just the field offices, but other places as well, the jobs of those DDS reps to adjudicate disability claims. So the unions know that they've got her because she was sent there with the purpose from the president to reestablish relations with them. 
So what's going to happen? So either Congress is going to have to come together to fund the SSA with more money, or the unions and the SSA are going to have to make a deal away from Congress with basically the IRS. Now, we know that the commissioner can work a deal with the IRS for more money in order to go ahead and meet the requirements and goals of processing these adjudications, these claims. We know this because Commissioner Saul reached out during essentially the stimulus you know, payments to the IRS for more money to pay more people to go ahead and process those stimulus checks. You may remember that when this happened, he was fired as a direct result of him not paying out the SSI checks uh, right away. And the reason why was because he was negotiating behind the scenes with the IRS to fund essentially his personnel to now do extra work on top of what they were already supposed to do, which was to process and figure out who needed a check, who was on the list, all that stuff. So they had extra work and they went to the IRS and said, you need to pay us more money to go ahead and process these claims. So what's going to happen is, A, Congress is either going to give them more money or B, Commissioner Kijikazi is going to put on basically, you know, the begging knee pads, as we put it from, you know, my family. Like when you have to go do something and it's tough, you got to ask for something, you put the knee pads on, you go over there and you beg them. And she's going to have to go to the IRS and say, look, we need this extra money in order to process this and make it a reality. Now, what will happen with that? It will take months and months to go ahead and get an agreement to be put together and then pass through. And what will happen with that is that all of a sudden uh, you will see more and more people being hired at the SSA. Now, new hires at the SSA are always very bad because they just don't know all the rules and regulations and how to process it. So you get a lot of very ignorant people, especially at the local field offices, that are just winging things, sending out incorrect things, etc. And the attorneys play a large part in having to rectify the content that's being sent out from the SSA. Yay, Shirley. Howdy, howdy. Thank you for the donation. Very cool, very cool. Um, I'll send you pictures of the house, by the way. I just, I, I literally just got out of the house um, from doing some sanding uh, with that little hand sander. So, but uh, anyways, so the point is um, she's going to be doing one of those two things. Now, it is my belief, but I don't have any backing or proof of it, that she is right now working with uh, basically uh, the IRS to go ahead and get additional funding. And here's why. President Biden doesn't really partake in, when it comes to the Social Security Administration, a lot of little bill passing. Pretty much Congress, when it comes to the SSA, it's all about mega bills, mega, mega, mega bills with tons of stuff in them. And then they get some general, super massive, ultra industrial name like Saving America Act or, you know, the universe is going to love us again act, you know, one of those crap names. So it is my opinion that Commissioner Kijikazi is right now working a deal with the IRS. I don't know if it's true, but that's that's what I think she's doing because that's her back door to getting more funding to hiring more people. Now, the next thing that you need to know is that as this process continues, you are going to see weird things happening with your benefits over the next two years because that's how much time it's going to take to reestablish and stabilize all these new employees and the weird things that they're going to put out. If you notice something, that is weird or odd or a letter. Do not ignore it. Make sure the SSA has your most current address. Like that's probably the most important thing because a lot of the times the SSA, they'll reach out by phone, sure, but they'll usually reach out with a physical letter through the US mail. So one of the things you should do every single year is send into the SSA a 789 with your current address and phone number on it. A 789 is an SSA statement form, a statement of claimant. I mean, you can always modify it to be a statement of third party, but the point is it's something you can write down instructions to the SSA on what they should know. And every year you should send into them your most current address and your most current phone number. So, and here's why there's rampant fraud, rampant fraud that's going on with, you know, things around the SSA. And so what's one of the big, the big things that's happening is that checks for people are getting sent to a new location. And then those people will go ahead and create a fake ID. They'll take it into a bank and they'll cash it. And, you know, they'll usually use low income homeless people to go cash the check with their photo on it. That way, if they get arrested, they don't care. The money's been pulled out and given to the drug dealer. And boom, there you go. 
So what you need to know about that is that you should always let the SSA know this is your current and updated address. That way your checks keep going to the same place. Now, if your direct deposit or goes on the you know green direct express card, cool, you don't have to worry about that. An additional thing you need to know is that um, there is very likely going to be... Um, okay, so you remember how the SSA was like, hey, we're bringing on this new person and we're going to have all this new training on equity and inclusion. There are pilot programs throughout the SSA, but just being realistic here, the equity and inclusion program, I am almost certain is at this point a low priority. And the reason why is they don't have the people to train like, so like in order to have like a working system, you have to have employees that are trained. They know what they're doing. They're feeling good. They're doing the right stuff. Cool right? They're following the government protocol. They don't even have the people, right? Like you could have the people and the people could be trained and the people could be good at it and they know what they're doing. They don't even have the people right now. So when it comes to like, okay, are these people being, you know, uh, do they have enough people to train? Do they have this? They, have, they don't have those people. So as a result of it, the problem is they've got to get people. And then once they get people and they're trained, and they've got experience doing it, then they can bring back this whole equity inclusion and yada yada stuff that they want to integrate into it. A lot of people are unhappy about it because it always tends to be to some degree uh, positive in some ways and very negative against other people in other ways. So you'll have to see, and I've reached out to the SSA specifically for what's going to be on these rights, equity, and inclusion uh, instructional courses that the employees of the SSA have to undergo. And they responded with, um, none of your business. It's an internal uh, training program. An internal training program basically means screw you. We're not telling you. We don't care. You're not part of our system. We're not giving you the info. Now I could always file an information act, you know, request and then basically get the stuff. But I, I don't even think, to be honest with you, that they're going to be doing much of it. And my my focus here with this is to see essentially where they're going to be going over the next couple of months with training people. Now, as you guys know, they tried to, they set up a thing for a thousand ALJ application where a thousand people could apply to become an administrative law judge. I think that they'll probably be doing another one of these in the not too distant future, maybe another two months, maybe another five months, whatever. They did a super expedited training of those individual ALJs. So what's interesting about that is just, just so you guys know, a lot of the old guard retired. And a lot of the old guard of administrative law judges, you know, the ones that decide your disability benefits, were like the, the chief ALJ of the local offices or maybe a step up, the chief regional, the blah, 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 blah. You know, they were kind of like your, you know, they were the leaders. They were the chief ALJs of their different sections. Because remember, there's many chief ALJs, you, you know, depending on how much area they oversee. And so what's going on right now is that... Um, the judges who may have only been working with the SSA for five, six years are now getting a chief ALJ certification because, you know, if they're willing to move, especially because, you know, what's happening is they just, uh, you know, they need that second guard because the, the old guard retired, that second guard to now take those positions. There's another thing too that you need to know about the administrative law judges that are deciding your social security disability benefit claims. They don't, really get paid that much or have that much staff. So one of the big things that happens with these ALJs, and I've heard this complaint multiple times from different people, but uh, the bottom line is that there are there are lots of judge positions out there, okay? Uh, you know, like the bigger federal courts or um, a specialty group, like a, you know, like another, other than disability benefits, like a VA judge or something like that. And they have significantly more um, crew, if you will, or, you know, employees, people to oversee, and their, their positions are less about the day-to-day -day operations, less about like the, the traffic court judge position, more about overseeing the overall, you know, production of documents, the analysis, the review. It, it, it's a very different position. Because remember, we have judges at the SSA that are doing like, you know, you know, very like, you know, they're doing the hearings and they're done and they'll do a quick review of the of the decision, stamp it next. Or they don't stamp it. They, they digi sign, but it, boom, next. 
And then we have judges, you know, who are basically not in, you know, like traffic court or administrative law judges. And then we have them in like high level thinking based, massive decision situations where like the law of the country will be decided by this case. I think one thing a lot of people don't understand about these judges too is that when you have, uh, you know, judges will always say, I'm going to upload, uh, uphold the law and only follow the law. And then a lot of people always sit back and go, well, wait a minute. These judges are making new law. And that's because if there is an argument at issue and the law doesn't directly address it, or there's been new technologies that have changed the circumstance by which this whole thing should normally be handled, then they create new laws. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Ernie Terrell, wow. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the donation. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate it. A $50 donation, that's incredible. Uh, a little hippo in the uh, in the box, which is really cool. Um, let's see. And I see a few things. Uh, I see a few questions here. Uh, the God said, how long to get SSI back pay? Um, once you're found disabled, basically it takes three weeks to get your back pay. It takes about two and a half weeks to get Medicaid set up and takes about three to four weeks to get your forward pay set up, which is your, your monthly check every month. Um, again, Ernie Terrell, a massive, massive donation. Thank you. Thank you so much because this house project that I'm working on has been a massive drain to my daily activities and just totally sucks, but it's, it's almost done. And I really appreciate it. That's just incredible. Um, okay, let me see if there's another question here that I can decide. Who decides your appeal review with pre-existing conditions? So if we're talking about appeal review at each level, uh, you know, I'll just take you through each level. At the initial filing level, the person who decides, you know, what your claim is, if you have pre-existing conditions, are those conditions severe enough? That's the DDS rep in conjunction with the DDS manager. The DDS rep basically creates the DDE report, which is a display determination explanation report. And then the manager of all those DDS reps reviews it and says, hey, you need to go get this. It's missing that, you know, da, 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 or go send them to another consultative examination medical expert appointment. And then, you know, you'll go from there. Some of these DDS managers are massive denial people. They want to deny, deny, deny. I'm not going to say geographically where we have one of those, but we have a couple of those in Florida and uh, they mass deny, mass deny. Um, but then other areas, uh, you have traditional regular DDS managers that, you know, adjudicate them properly without this mass deny effect. So that's at the initial filing level. Reconsideration, very similar. Okay. It goes to a different person in a different room, but ultimately it goes in front of that DDS manager. And the DDS manager basically with the DDS rep, you know, they finalize the decision. If it's approved, it goes up for quality control and then basically back to the local field office if it's full stamp approval. If it's denied, it goes straight back to the field office. If you go basically uh, to the next level up, so initial filing reconsideration ALJ hearing level, at the ALJ hearing level, the person that decides your claim is the administrative law judge. The administrative law judge will be present during the hearing, and then basically the administrative law judge gives a you know thumbs up, thumbs down, here's my notes, here's what I like, here's what I don't like to their writer. And then the writer will write it up and then there, it's handed to the judge. The judge will read over it, make sure it's all good. And then it will be sent out. Comes in three flavors. Unfavorable, you're denied. Partially favorable, you're approved, but they're moving your alleged onset date. You know, the date when you're claiming that you for, were found, that you are disabled, they're gonna move that date to a date that makes more sense based off the medical record. And then number three, uh, fully favorable. They're approving uh, you from the date that which you claimed you became severely impaired and it matches with the record and looks good. Then you get to appeals council. You'll see two or three judges on an appeals council review. Could be a denial, could be an approval, but usually it's a remand if there's a good point to it. Remand just means they're sending it back to the administrative law judge to change what the judge has to do and then make a new decision based on those changes. Let's say you have to appeal up to federal district court circuit court, Supreme Court. Again, you could be faced with a denial, approval, or remand uh, at each one of those levels. Although there's no, um, you know, you get to the Supreme Court of the United States, that's it. 
you know, you get an approval or don't. I remember with the Supreme Court of the United States, they they reserve the right to deny hearing, like being president and adjudicating that claim. So they're they're one of the courts that actually has this really interesting thing, which is they get to basically go ahead and say, we want to review this or we don't. I remember sometimes they will agree with a decision made at the next court down, and sometimes they won't, but they will just not agree to review it. So they could be in favor of it, they could be against it, but they reserve the right to say whether or not they're going to actually, you know, adjudicate the claim. That's one of the weird things about the Supreme Court of the United States is that it's like the bonus round. Like a lot of people think like you have a right to it. You actually don't have a right to the Supreme Court of the United States. You have a right to its existence. You have a right to, you know, if they're if they say they're going to hear it, that they'll hear it. But ultimately, you don't have a right to the Supreme Court of the United States in the sense that if you appeal from circuit court to the Supreme Court of the United States at the federal level, you have you they get to decide. It's at their pleasure as to whether or not they will actually hear your claim. Now, this is a good segue as to who can potentially change your, your benefits. And any of these individuals can grant or deny your benefits. Although when you get to the federal uh, district circuit and Supreme Court, although the Supreme Court can do pretty much what it wants to, when you get to the district and circuit courts, they will always remand it back to the SSA for the SSA to handle its adjudication within the agency. But the Supreme Court of the United States, they hold complete and utter jurisdiction as the wielding force of the constitution. So, but they will usually, I mean, by the time it gets there, that's where the decision is going to be made. It's very rare that you'll end up with a remand at that point. I mean, they might do it, but it's they just they, they don't do it. They they decide the claim at that point. So what you need to know is that um, you know basically any one of these judges, although if it's the district or circuit court, they'll usually remand if they see that something needs to be fixed. Any one of these judges can increase, reduce, cut off your benefits. And so what happens there? is that if you already have benefits, you go through what's called the eight-step sequential process, the eight elements to decide if you're still disabled. If you're just seeking benefits, you go through the five-step sequential process, or if you're a kid, the three-step sequential process, which means they're just getting rid of the two last elements of the adult five-step sequential process, which are, can you do your past relevant work? And then element five, can you do relevant transferable skilled work or unskilled work? All right. So those are people as well that can go ahead and affect, uh, essentially, the amount of your benefits. Now, we've gone through the local level people. We've gone through the regional level people. We've gone through the executives executives of the Social Security Administration. We've gone through the adjudicators at the SSA, the ALJs and the AAJs. We've gone through the higher federal appellate judges and what they can do with the claim. We've gone through Congress, uh, the House, the Senate, and the President. What's interesting about social security benefits and why it's an agency that has like the ultimate height, because not every agency reports to the president, like not every commissioner has that power. Some agencies that are smaller have to report to some other person that reports to the president. But uh, the SSA is one of the biggies ob for obvious reasons. Massive budget goes to it. You know, it's a huge enterprise and it's one of the most important programs in the United States. What's weird that a lot of people don't realize is that in the 1930s, like the very beginning of the 1930s, we didn't have this. We had VA benefits. VA benefits go back to over 100 years before the signing of the Constitution when you had pilgrims that were, um, what are they called? Um, Puritans, like those Puritan pilgrims. Um, so, you know, VA benefits go all the way back. But the government always wants to take care of their veterans because, you know, otherwise people aren't going to sign up to fight. You know, if you get injured and then you're not taken care of by the federal government, it's not a good deal. Not a good deal for you. You're not going to want to sign up because if you get injured and you're not taken care of, you're not going to want to, you're not going to want to do this thing. So on the other side of the coin, you have the SSA personnel or you have, you know, people that are civilians trying to get civilian disability benefits or retirement. Remember retirement in 1930s, 1950s was disability. 1970s was SSI through Nixon. So what you have to keep in mind is that social security benefits, right? Social security, that's not for VA, not for people who served in the military. Those benefits only came around the 1930s. So what you have to wrestle with, with this whole thing is understanding 
why it's set up like this. And one of the inherent problems with the civilian side is that the government wants to support civilians, obviously and definitively not as much as its veterans, which is why the veterans get to stack their benefits. They get SSDI and VA benefits or retirement and VA benefits. But the, the bottom line is, when it comes to, and just so you know, like I have a video coming out through Combat Craig's channel that's going to explain in detail how the calculations are done for when you stack SSDI benefits or how SSI benefits are calculated against VA benefits. And if you get so much VA benefits, at what point will you not be able to get SSI benefits? So that's going to be a Combat Craig video. But um, the, the point here that you should keep in mind with this is that the Social Security Administration has a lot of ways that it can do things to get around Congress not being active. But the thing that involves the SSA having enough funding for retirement benefits to not fail, where it's, you know, where it's trust fund, excuse me, runs out. And that means 23% reduction in the next 10 years of benefits. That has to be done by Congress. That is such a massive, massive change that has to be done by Congress. It can't be done by the court system can't be done uh, by the president. I mean, a president could do an executive order, but it just, you need Congress on board. You need Congress on board to really make that happen. So the problem that we are facing about who is most likely to ruin your benefits right now, it's not SSA personnel. It's not. I mean, they might make a screw up. They might, you know, at the local field office level and input something into the machine incorrectly, right? They might, whoops. But realistically, the, the group that is going to screw you out of the most money, that's Congress. Congress, for some reason, has an anti-Social Security thing going on. Now, I would like to propose something to you as a final thought, and I would like your input on this. There are, uh, you know, it's a non-political statement. There are Republicans, Independents, and Democrats, and then, of course, variations within that. The Republicans uh, go all the way to supporting Social Security benefits to those who want to lessen it increase the age, et cetera. You have Democrats that are in the middle on this thing of let's just let the clock run to those who are like, we need to increase benefits by $200 or give everybody a social security stimulus by you know, $1,400 or $2,000. What's odd? And I, I would like your thoughts on this. At what point are the Democrats going to become more effective at passing legislation that supports extending the forecast of how long your retirement, disability, widows, you know, surviving spouse, all that kind of stuff, spousal benefits. At what point are the Democrats going to become more effective at fixing the Social Security benefit problem? That's my question. I don't know. Because with President Biden now in the final two years before re-election, he's going to have to come out with some big statements of what he wants to do, but he doesn't have a lot of the votes he's going to need. So when they promise you Social Security potential change, the thing you run into is, at what point will the Democrats become more effective at passing legislation that enhances the forecast for social security benefits to live longer than they currently will. That's my question to you. That's my question. Um, and, and I think, I think at this point, um, to be fair, the middle ground Republicans have come up with some really good ideas with the middle ground Democrats. A lot of people like to put in the chat section and the comment section like, Oh wow. We just need Bernie in there. Bernie if I'm to be fair, is one of the most ineffective politicians that we have because he's always at the extreme end. If you want to know the truth about politicians, you should because it's, it works in all areas, social security benefits included. The politicians that are the most extreme, like the most Republican-y Republicans that exist and the most Democratic Democrats that exist, they're super ineffective hyper ineffective. They're more of like a figurehead that was put there to represent the pole in the ground, the line in the sand. 
And so the problem with that is that we have a bunch of poles in the sand all over the Democratic Party, like all over the place. This one's for these rights and these rights and these rights, but they're like way out there. Same thing with the Republican Party. We have these poles in the sand that are, we want to keep this. We won't allow that. We're not going to do this. We're going to fund this. We're going to get rid of you. We're deregulate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have these like lots of poles that represent how far out on each side of the spectrum they are. And what scares me about this is that we don't have enough middle ground politicians. Now, in the 1980s, everybody would run to the middle as a politician. But nowadays, that's switched, which is why we have such a gridlock or put another way, a very unhealthy political environment. And as a reality of this, we are seeing basically Democrats voting in more people that are like extreme left. And we're seeing Republicans voting in. Well, actually, Republicans voted in Donald Trump, who wasn't a Democrat and wasn't a Republican. In fact, Donald Trump back in the day was going to run as a Democrat. And then he had to pick a party nowadays. And his, you know, anybody that owns businesses like that, anybody who comes from that like if, if you have somebody from a military background almost certainly they're going to go republican if you have somebody who comes from owning businesses owning land um you know that's that kind of stuff like how money is made like the more educated you have with somebody that actually practices how money is made how to make more money stuff like that they're almost always in the republican camp sure you get billionaires nearly you know trillionaires because that's where they're all going with this sure you get super millionaires and billionaires right who are owning businesses and land and are super Democrat. But those are people who are insulated. It wouldn't matter if they pass these laws that hurt the super rich. They're insulated. They have so much money. It's just not, it's not going to matter. Whereas the Republican side, they are very, very, very aware of what their bank account says every morning. They wake up, they go on their phone, they're eating their donut and boom, they know how much they have, what they've lost, what they gained, et cetera. So, the problem is that we are seeing more of these extreme politicians going in as placeholders. And uh, Donald Trump, who's going through all these legal issues right now, we're not going to go into that, was more middle right than what's all the way over here. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about, you know, because if you watch like Democrat based television shows, what you end up with is like every third or fourth news story is like Donald Trump. Like they focus severely on Donald Trump. Like it's, they talk about Donald Trump when the Fox news talks about Donald Trump. And it's this fascination with trying to, to, to murder off the idea of the big businessman, you know, being over the tiny employees. And What's interesting is that we have this problem, which is directly related to social security benefits. And the problem is that more people, right, want to have better benefits, more job security, like they know if they're going to get fired or not, and they have ways to protect themselves, more vacations, more upfront pay, more repetitive monthly pay, whatever. They want all these benefits. And we had that right at the end of COVID, right? And then... And then we went into this different political arrangement and structurally the businesses faltered, failed, et cetera. You know, and some, I had this person on the phone with me arguing that like the, the, the culture of the people hasn't really changed, right? That, that the culture of how women are, the culture of how men are in America hasn't really changed. I agree with them in part and I disagree with them in part. And here's why. America is now facing a potential World War III situation with China, Russia, India, Pakistan. The list just goes on and on. I mean, even France is leaning with China now. And their version of NATO, which of course they're not NATO, but their version of it is starting to become stronger than essentially America's NATO. And so the problem we're running into is that social security benefits are based off of people essentially working, paying FICA taxes, and those benefits then down the line with the next generation paying for the people who are requesting now, next generation pays for them, right? It's a pyramid scheme, right? The people who are old, the younger people pay for them. 
the people who are about to die, or the people who are old paid for them, right? So that's how that pyramid scheme works with social security benefits. Now, with that said, when it comes to politics and social security benefits, you can't have outliers, right? Extreme. You can't have like the super Bernie Sanders people and a lot of Bernie people and a lot of the super, super hardcore Republicans. They're not going to vote to save social security benefits because when you inherently look at social security benefits, it's not a super left or super right idea. It's not. In fact, social insurance is like super middle. It's super middle. Some people will argue middle left, but I, I disagree with that. I think it's very in the middle because the whole idea about social insurance, which is like social security, disability insurance benefits, retirement benefits, you know, disabled little child benefits. The whole idea with it is that people won't go hungry and then rob or murder other people because they're starving. That's the whole idea of it. The whole idea of it is we are keeping people from getting below a certain level of living, right? We don't, we want them here. We, we don't want them down here because if they're down here, they're going to commit a lot of crimes. They're going to die. You know, it's, it's bad. So my argument is, you know, sure. Bernie will come out with a statement. Hey, we need to massively, you know, increase funding. And then the Republicans will come out from their way off side statement, you know, Hey, we need to go ahead and raise the retirement age and we need to cut benefits, blah, blah, blah. These outliers are not going to be useful for social security benefit changes in the future. They're not. I mean, they're cool to look at. You have a few token ones, but what we have now is not a few token ones. What we have now is like way too many token ones on this side, way too many token politicians on that side. It's not good. So when you guys look at voting, um, the major outliers, the, the pole in the sand, as far as we can throw the ball people in politics, they're not good for social security benefits. Um, the, the people that are good for social security benefits are people that are in the middle that are willing to do incremental changes to benefit the program so that within 10 years we can save retirement. But the like, we're going to do massive changes. We're going to do these other massive changes. We don't need more politicians like that. We have enough of them. They don't help. So what we need is somebody not like Biden and potentially somebody not like Trump, although Trump is more in the middle than essentially Biden with his Biden's more left. He's not as left as Bernie, definitely not as left as Bernie. But if we have the spectrum, Biden's more here, Bernie, and then Trump is more here. If the middle's here, Trump is more here, but like Biden's more like over here. And uh, not that Trump is any big supporter of social security benefits. I mean, he put commissioner Saul in, which, was not good, not good for disability benefits in any way. Super, ma changed some major rules. And I mean, he hunted for them uh, that changed the game in a very negative way to obtain disability benefits. So, um, so who are those good guys in the middle? So I actually created a list in an Excel sheet that had the politicians and then I graded them. And then I got, and then I got nervous about publishing that list. Because the problem with publishing that list is that when the most viewed and subscribed to social security disability attorney in America publishes a list of who you should vote for, all of a sudden we're turning into A, a political organization, and a B, a basic target as a law firm for all these politicians to attack. And here's why. Politicians get lots of people to think that they are the good guys or the good girls or whatever, however you want to put it. But the reality is, is that they can't do a lot of the things that you believe they would do. Like a lot of people think Biden's going to do all this stuff. He's not. A lot of people think Trump getting back in is going to do all this stuff. He's not. Like it's just, it's beyond their ability to do all these massive things that you believe that they will do because you like them. We call it the halo effect, right? The halo effect is that we like them. Therefore, we give them the benefit of doubt and expect that they will give us the benefit of the doubt in a big way to go ahead and increase our life in a positive way. We might believe they would do something, but in reality, their brain's thinking they don't want to do it. They're not going to do it, et cetera. So the bottom line is ultimately what you guys have to look at in the future of voting. And I'll just break it down for you. I mean, that way you kind of know what's going to be important. Military, military rights, military people, super important military if we don't have enough soldiers massive problem 
massive problem. We need backcountry farm soldiers, people who know how to shoot, people who know how to go ahead and survive. We need them. And we need them signing up for the military. Right now, military numbers are extremely low. Extremely low. Social security benefits. We have to have some sort of massive stimulus to the system, not to the people, to the system to keep the system from failing. And we also need a class action lawsuit against the cost of living adjustment. Another thing that we need uh, is basically a reform on essentially, uh, you know, when it comes to our powers as civilians, um, we need a new bill of rights as to what the federal government is allowed to go ahead and edit out of our constitutional rights. We saw massive losses of our rights during the Bush era with 9-11. We saw another massive limit of our human rights um, during the Biden era when it comes to these you know, super stimulus payments that were passed. The problem I foresee is that we will continue to sell our rights for stimulus money because they placed us in a desperate situation. I don't know what the fix of that is. I don't because... Look, all right, let me tell you how, what it's like for homeless people so that you kind of understand this. Homeless people used to be able to buy a can of soup for 50 cents. Then it became a dollar. Now it's over $3 in some of these dollar stores for a single can of soup. So what you have to understand is that the homeless centers are getting filled with people because they're just looking for donated food that's going to go bad the next day. And, you know, all these grocery stores mass donate food that's going to go bad the next day because then they get a tax write off. So you're going to see homeless centers getting filled all over the place with people who need food because starvation literally over the next year is going to be a real thing for the homeless because they, they just can't afford they can't afford the inflation prices of food. So we know that they are desperate at the federal government level. They're going to be raising rates very likely again soon. This is going to massively slow down the ability to basically rent money because that's what a mortgage is. That's what a, a loan is. You're renting money. I'm going to rent this chunk of money. And then as a result of renting this chunk of money, I'm going to use it for this purpose, which is then going to make me more money than the cost of the rent that I have to pay back, right? Some APR percentage. So the idea is that they're going to slow down people's ability to make money which doesn't do a whole lot for those who are poor and on social security benefits, which most people on social security benefits at this point are poor. So the bottom line is that they realized from the last stimulus that if they mass fund social security benefits, they give social security recipients more money, then they immediately go and spend it on things. And it could be anything. It could be food, could be a watch, could be whatever, but they spend the money on something. When they spend that money, it decreases the amount of those items in this country, and then more of those items have to be brought in, supply and demand. There is a low supply and a high demand, which means the price of the item goes up because if somebody goes to the store, they can't buy another one because it's not back in the country yet. So that means that the prices of all the items go up, which means if they did a stimulus for the Social Security recipients, that would cause massive, massive inflation. So there's a balancing effect now. The balancing effect is, unfortunately, how do they keep the poor fed just enough so that they don't cause inflation? And how do they cause the middle and high income people who want to take out a loan? Because remember, you can't take out a loan when you're poor because there's no money to collect against, right? The whole idea of a loan is that we're giving you money because you have the ability to pay it back. So you got to be middle income or high income in order to get a loan. So the point is, they're saying, how do we keep money out of the hands of the middle, middle income and high income people who are getting loans to buy things, start businesses, create things, et cetera, to, you know, basically, you know, as employers would say, enrich themselves. So what the government has decided to do is let the poor struggle more and not be able to eat. So basically they're, they're, <laughs> under this administration causing a forced starvation. And on top of that, they are restricting the middle income and the higher income individuals 
from getting more money to buy a property or buy uh, this or increase their business's ability to do that or buy more advertising for their business. Which means that what you're going to see is a drop in innovation and new companies from essentially the middle and upper you know, class individuals that are earning middle incomes and higher incomes. Now, everything that you see financially comes down to one really important figure, which is productivity. If productivity is up and people are working and they got to make products and they're selling products, then supply and demand are met and everything's cool. But what we're seeing here is low productivity in the United States, low fertility rates in the United States, high need in the United States, and massive inflation in the United States. So the problem is if we have runaway inflation and they're going to keep raising the rates, even though we just had a month that was really good, really dropped the inflation rate number, that doesn't mean it's going to stay there. What happens when there's a World War III? And will that benefit Social Security benefits in a positive way? What I would say is this. If there were to be a World War III, Social Security benefits would not be at the top of the table for legislation. Social Security benefits would probably five to six years down the line once the war ended, then come up. But at that point, it would be hard, very difficult to fix the retirement issue. Another thing to keep in mind is that the spoils of war, right? So remember, one nation would, would go ahead and take over another nation, and they would steal all the stuff that they had in their banks, all their gold and jewels and whatever, and they would enrich themselves with this bounty, right? Well, that's not how war works anymore. The bounty is raw resources, right? So Because they're not stealing the, jewel, the jewels and the and the uh, you know the stuff like that uh, from their banking system. What they're doing is they're getting natural resources, oil, gas, minerals, etc., from those countries that have taken over. So then you've got to ask yourself: if there was a World War III, and the U.S. couldn't really gain, like what we did with Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, etc., a natural gas or a, an oil benefit to it, how? successful do you think we will be as a country winning a war where there's no future where there's essentially these natural resources to be able to pay for and you know validate the reason we had a war over that country how much do you think ukraine is really worth in all of this well it's worth more than the social security administration because that other video we did specifically outlined and explained how we spent over $70 billion in 2022 sending and funding to Ukraine, whereas we only spent $13.34 billion for the administration of Social Security benefits with the SSA, which means that Ukraine was funded five times more than the SSA administration in 2022. So if war happens, SSA benefits are going to be at the bottom of the barrel when it comes to new legislation. And that worries me because when it comes to who could change your benefits, who could modify your benefits, they're going to have a money problem. And it's not just the administration of the benefits, it's the trust funds too. So what I'm actually really interested in seeing uh, are the reports that are going to be released from the National Academy of Social Insurance, specifically with how COVID affected Social Security benefits. Because it's like a weird little microcosm of time where they had legislation, they had you know mass changeover due to a lot of deaths as a result of COVID. People who were disabled or older passed away at a much higher rate. So those numbers are going to teach us a lot about what would happen with the World War III scenario. Not that like you know there would be another COVID style whatever, but you never know. You never know if there's a terrible bomb that could go off. You never know if there's a terrible, you know, dirty bomb or a chemical bomb or whatever that would occur and how that would affect social security benefits. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you those reports that the National Academy of Social Insurance, the nonprofit in Washington, D.C., that they create and present, I guarantee you are going to teach us a lot about what will happen in World War III if a World War III happens concerning social security benefits. All right. 
I have talked way too much about too many things here. I hope you enjoyed this. Let me see if there's any questions over here real quick. Um, yeah, the yen is going to probably replace the US dollar as the reserve currency, which would kill the US currency. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Ben Jails. Okay, so. Um, okay, cool. So I'm not seeing any questions here. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, Faith Moore, absolutely. If we had mass funded the Social Security Administration with the money that we sent to Ukraine, then we would have disability claims being decided in like two to three months. You know what I mean? It just boom, 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 boom. Because they had tons of people. It could have even been faster than that. Um, anyways, guys, I will catch you a little bit later. Uh, I'm going to go to bed. I have four or five videos set up for you tomorrow. Uh, they're really cool videos. Um, please remember uh, when it comes to donating, uh, basically to Cheyenne's son when it comes to driving him around so that he can play in these special basketball games so that he can get a scholarship. Because remember, she's a single mom with three kids. And the dad is not participating in funding at all. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, the child going around and doing these basketball games to go ahead and, you know, get a scholarship. Which, you know, happens. I mean, the, whoever you marry, that's who you're stuck with. So, you know, well, to some degree, you're stuck with them. Um, the next videos that we're going to be doing tomorrow is can a cheating spouse still get your social security benefits at the end of the day? We'll answer that one. Next video we're going to be doing tomorrow. Um, what happens when people lose faith in retirement benefits and the youth change the laws and rules so that they no longer have to pay into retirement? Next one we're going to be doing uh, specifically on is how do education levels affect the amount that you receive in social security benefits? Like how much retirement benefit does like, you know, somebody without a college degree, get a college degree, master's, doctorate, postdoctorate. So we're going to answer that tomorrow. And uh, you guys have a wonderful, wonderful night. Please remember to like subscribe and leave five star reviews. Easiest way to leave a five star review is just Google disability resolution, uh, Florida or Orlando or, you know, any, any one of those central Florida, but disability resolution law firm, uh, you can put Florida in there. It'll pop up faster and uh, should be good to go. I'll catch you later. Have a wonderful night. And we'll go from there. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye.